back at WNST, Towson Baltimore and Baltimore Positive. This is going to be a fun one. We're down here at the Chop Tank. We're in Fells Point. Uh, it is all brought to you by the Maryland Lottery. Let yourself play. We're going to be playing uh, next week at Fadley's in Lexington Market. We're going to be on Friday at uh, Nick's Grandstand Grill in Timonium. Looking forward to having a crab cake with Tommy. And then we're with the mayor, Brandon Scott, on Wednesday the 17th at Coco's in Laurelville. I haven't had a Coco's crab cake in 20 years. I have not had the Chop Tank crab cake. I'm about to have that. We're with the Atlas Group today. We're here in Fells Point, in the middle of Fells Point. And I, and I am honored that you guys have, have made the turnover here. Your daughter couldn't make it here today. But uh, when I talk about family businesses in Fells Point, I've had Tony Tochterman drop by here. My dear friend Patrick Sutton came by here. They live in the community. I've been knowing you almost four decades, Ron Furman. And, uh, you what's, know, I, what's a decade? I, it's 10 years, uh, <laughs> nine years, uh, 11 months, and 30 days. Um, I think of your place. I'm looking at your place here, and I walk by, and I was kidding around with Tracy the other days. I never leave your place without walking. What street is that? Without Which Lancaster. Is, that's Lancaster. Lancaster. Okay, because I know it's not. Tested. I walk down Lancaster, and bar, bar is. I used to drink in bar when I was 17 in 1980. <laughs> Before that, <laughs> when did you make Max's on Broadway your thing? I, I want to hear your story. By the way, you, uh, thanks for coming. I appreciate everybody making turns you waited in line you distracted me i thought you left me i thought you're mad at me when tony was here how tony can, was I, telling how can, lefty I, how can I be ma how can i be mad at you well i wonder the same thing i, was I mean other nice people reviews. i know get mad at you but i, I called you the best music you. venue in the city in 1987 and 88 you know i gave you the love pissed hammer jacks off louis wasn't happy with me <laughs> <laughs> you want you love music right was that your thing you love music I, yeah i enjoyed it i love music i love beer i love people Loved having a good time. What what was that before you had it? Uh, a disco, the Acropolis. The Acropolis. Now were all these Greek owned? But the same person owned them all, or no? No, because I, I Dionysos was where I had. You know what I'm talking about, right? Dionysos. Does that mean anything to you? Yeah, I remember it. I okay, just, so it, I guess it was where Sammy's was. That's where I had my first illicit beer. I think 1985, 86, us 17, 18, whatever. And then when did you come along with Max's on Broadway? 86. 86 was your year. 86 is... What did you do before then? I've never talked... I don't even know you, man. Like, I just knew you were Ron Furman from Max's. I was And retired. if I wanted to see rock and roll that was legitimate, if I wanted to run into Roger Waters, or Roger McGuinn from the Birds, you know, out on the street, I would do it at your place. If I wanted to drink with Danny Partridge and, and David Cassidy, I would come to your place. Danny Partridge. Danny Bonacucci. Danny Booty Dutch. He was great. He was a great guy, you know. He, he was a character. What did you have to do with this? Anything? Nothing. <laughs> when did you come along? Uh, you long, never even introduced Long her. time before that. When? Uh, Forty-some years ago. Oh. <laughs> Forty-five years ago. Right? Yeah. Yeah. How, how did you wind up in a bar? I, seriously, I want you to, I, you're not answering me. You're deflecting. No. I, so when I talk to the guys from Looney's and, and like let's, when let's I, find, just point this when I out. find the bar me, in Canton. Let me point this out. Baltimore was different in the 80s. Me a chance to okay. tell it. Baltimore in the 80s was different. I mean, it really was. Uh, yes. Very different than it is now, that's for sure. But, but when I think of Canton, I grew up in Dundalk. Canton was not a nice place when I was a kid. It was a, it was a, Fells Point wasn't a great place. See, I don't think of it like that. I, no. I mean, Fells Point was a little rough and tough. Was it know? really? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't what it is today, that's for sure. But it wasn't that bad, but it still, it was... You when know. you went to open your place, what else was... I mean, did the Green Turtle exist? Did just come online then, Paco, maybe with that? Maybe? They had opened up right, right after. after us. Yeah. What was the centerpiece of Fells Point then? I mean, I'm Jimmy's. <laughs> oh, right. It was a diner, right? So the and diner was know, the there centerpiece. Was, there, there was Turkey Joe's. Bertha's there was, Muscles. Like, that was a thing. There was Bertha's. There was Turkey Joe's. There was... Uh, the horse. Ledbetter's. There was a horse. Led betters in the horse, okay. I mean, they were there from the beginning of yeah. time, right? Howard, well, Howard, yeah. Howard Gerber had, had it. Uh, God, I forgot what year he opened. But uh, Howard worked uh, prior to that at No Fish Today on okay. Utah Street, okay. where I worked when I was a kid. So you worked at No Fish Today Yes, I on had a Utah Street. Great job. Got paid $10 a night and all you could drink. What a job. So, 86, you had, because it's the same time for me. I mean, like, I, I started drinking in, any place I could get in. I was 17. Uh, Roto's was, you know, still Roto's, but 
I'm thinking about the disco that was 722. Is that what it was 723. called? 723. 2023. That was that. That's a. That was a, September's before that. September's. Okay. That, that. But that was always a disco. Yeah. That was a yeah, disco. It was a dance club. Yeah. Was anybody else doing live music the way you were? Not not the cat's eye and like booking a little band in a in a bar, but bringing in national acts. Was it, Fells Point never had anything uh, like that, did it? Eight by t- not Fells Point. Not eight Fells by Point. Ten. Cross Street had that. Yeah. That's what led me there. By the way, when I was at Mother's, you'll appreciate this, being being with the family, uh, Dave Rather was unavailable, so he sent his wife to be the guest. Turns out I met her at Turner's t- Tendon Bar, and we were talking about the pit beef out in front of the 8x10. And I tell these old stories. I still call your places Max's on Broadway. So, yeah. I, I called it that on the Internet today. When did it cease to become that and became Tap House? When did we do that? 95? Six, I think, maybe. 95. 95, okay. Your place has been the Tap House for 27 years, and I still call it the old name. Most people do. I still call it the Civic Center. <laughs> and I'm Royal Farm sponsored, you know. Um, f- for you with beer, you went from music to beer at a time when I wasn't ready. No. I wasn't ready. I, it, I, I was a Coors Light, Bud Light drinker. we never went from music to beer. There was always beer. There was always beer, beer. We, we when had we did music. So prior to this. I never noticed because I drank Regular beer, you Pri- know. Prior, you mean TV beer. So prior oh, the TV to, to Max's and the music scene and when we got involved with the bar, I was in the auto parts business with my family. Now, we sold the business. I wasn't doing anything. I was pretty, pretty much uh, retired. My wife was CFO of a long-distance company, and she was doing well. And I was trying to figure out what I was going to do for the rest of my life. And the opportunity came well, here. Well, you follow passion. I mean, I follow the passion of sports that, I, I, I mean, I'm wearing my Raven thing, and I like the Ravens and all that, but I don't feel the same way about sports at 53 well, I, that I did at 23. We were having problems in the bar, and it was suggested that I come in and take it over. And I told my wife I'd be there six months, set up some controls, and then I was... In 86. Yeah, and then I would go get a real job. I never really had... Any you didn't have control in that. Once no, Blue but Rodeo did, started playing. <laughs> well, I, didn't, I never had intention of leaving, really, but I wouldn't tell her that. But So uh, I took it over, and I started making changes and started bringing in different acts every night. You know, they were doing, like, lounge acts, like Wednesdays and Thursdays, the same band, Friday and Saturday, the same band, and a blues jam on Sundays. Well, I found you. Maybe you know this. I, I was the music critic at the paper. Mm-hmm. I, I was at the... The News American in 84 and 85. I was 15, 16 years old. Does anybody remember that? The News American? I do. Yeah. Some, some days. It comes up. We had a reunion a couple of weeks ago down at the Guinness factory, so there were a few of us still uh, meandering around from 1984, 85, 86. And I, I, they, I was sitting in the newsroom, and a guy named Scott Labar was the entertainment editor, and he said, hey, kid, what do you know about Aerosmith? <laughs> and I'm like... I know everything about Steven Tyler. I know, I know the Toxic Twins. Uh, Joe Perry, yeah, dream on. He's like, well, he's going to be calling in 15 minutes. Come up with some questions for him. It turned out to be Tom Hamilton, the bass player. So that was in uh, 1984, and I wrote a piece, and then I got Getty Lee on the phone, and then the next thing you know, I got Paul Stanley on the phone, which was amazing because I was a Kiss fan. It's 1984. I'm 15 years old. I'm Dundalk High. I'm at, in high school. Those two years at the News American, I did my thing, and then I got to the Sun, and when I got to the Sun, everybody was 35 plus. I was the young. I was 17, 18 years. I was the youngest guy by 100 years. So Nobody, you were the guy that brought the coffee. At the News American, I was at the Sun. It was Chinese food. It was Chinese. <laughs> they opened Young's Carry Out, pepper, pepperoni's pizza up by the DAC. And I went into Ed, to uh, Ed Hewitt, the late great Ed Hewitt, whose son works at Pappas's. I'll be having a crab cake there at some point too, up to Um and, I, and, and intimidating, but I had all these clips, and I had interviewed Triumph and Rush and all these Ari Speedwagon, these bands. And I said, there are 2,000 people at Hammerjacks every night, and I see them, and they're rock and roll, and we, we should be Hammer, and, and Merryweather Post, and there's no reviews. And I uh, can't, I'll pay you $25 a store. You, you call them. And the next thing you know, you opened. Hammerjacks was Hammerjacks. Bud Becker loves to tell the story of meeting me at 17 years of age. And letting me into Hammerjacks, I was under I was underage you in your underage. place. I was underage in your place, so I don't remember that story. Maybe you do, but I remember with Hammerjacks, Bud Becker. I, I only thing I promised them was I wouldn't drink because I didn't want to lose my job. I had the greatest job in the world. I got to hang out in your bars, 
and and write about it every get paid for it every night. So I didn't want to drink. I drank in the parking lot, but I never drank inside Hammer. It was too expensive to drink in Hammer. Your place was expensive. So um, as a kid, and I, you came online, and the next thing I know, eight by ten had bands. Not the bands I was interested in. I was more interested in the Capitol Center and the Merryweather, you know, the, the bigger bands. But then I got to know the music industry people, and that's where you come in because they would say, ah, oh, this band's playing at Max's on Broadway. You know that place? I said, well, I better figure it out. And that's when you came in, and you were always magnanimous because you wanted to see your name in it. You always treated me awesome. You know, like whatever I wanted, you gave me sort of the run of the place. But I would come down and write about your bands. Well, it was Peter Himmelrich. Like, all of those bands. Himmelman. Himmelman. Excuse me. I'm sorry. <laughs> My bad. Um, I, Sam Himmelrich. Right? That's the parking lot. My bad. Um, but I would come down and write these reviews and be a part of it. And you were doing something no one else was doing. And you were, to me, a guy doing it on your own dime. You weren't funded. You, you, were, you were like, it was really important that people showed up and drank and paid the band. <laughs> really important. It was really, really, <laughs> like, it was very obvious to me that this was important to you, you know, and that you love music so much. Uh, I had a great time, you know, but towards the end, I kind of felt like I was a patron of the arts. <laughs> that, that's well, kind of really like a hard that's, business. It's a tough business. I, mean, I guess don't that's the thing it. that I understood that then. And at, at the level that we were doing it, you know, we could put 300 people in the place. And, you know, one day you would pack the place with a band that everybody heard of. The next day you'd have an incredible act and 20 people would show up. You know? Do you know my Smashing Pumpkin story? Do what? Do you know my Smashing Pumpkin story? I know mine. What's Let's, yours? Uh, I paid him. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, no, here, here's the mine. The first time they played. The first time they played. They opened up for Rudy okay. that owned Sticky Fingers down the street. He had a band called Jackpot. I love Rudy, by the way. Okay. Rudy's one of my favorite people. So, so Rudy's band was playing. They opened up for him. I think I paid Smashing Pumpkins 150 bucks, And, you know. All right, so here's how the story works. And I, I, I told my wife about this. A few for the months first later, time. they came back and you couldn't get in the room. Okay, I was at the first one. Okay? It was Valentine's night. I had my heart broken. I had a girlfriend break up with me. I'll never, I'll never forget this. So the, the music um, industry people took to me. And I haven't told it, and I'll tell you this. I don't think I've ever told this on the air. I told it to a human being the other day who was interested in, in the music kind of way of how did you interview David Bowie and Robert Plant and Jimmy P? Why you? Why? That's like almost famous. I'm like, it's exactly like almost famous. I was 17 years old. In, in 1986, I started writing these at The Sun. In 87, and you can look the date up, the A.S. Able Company sold The Sun to Times Mirror. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget, I was sitting at Colgate Elementary, and my phone went off, I was with my son, and my boss, Jack, said, uh, very official call, we, we've been sold to Times Mirror. And I'm like, I don't know what the hell that means, but am I still employed? Yes, good, I'll see you tomorrow. Okay, good. So when Times Mirror came in, and this is before the internet, any of this stuff, they had a wire. You're familiar, like the AP wire, right. the UPI wire. The wire when in the news old newspapers, news. right, we had a, we had a in, the, in the News American, we had this printer that would spit out. Dot matrix. Dot matrix paper, right? You put the little dots in, and it would you get third inning, Cardinals three, Cubs two. Here are the pictures. And it would just it would spit out. Then computers came. Green VDT, and this is the time I am. So my stories started going out on the wire because of Times Mirror. And every newspaper in the country bought the Times Mirror wire. So when the Rembrandts would show up and play at your place with this hit, you know. Do you remember once upon... You know, so like, okay, I interview those guys and I write the story and the publicist is very happy that I write the story and I'm not really sure why because I think I'm special. Um, what's special is it went out on the Times Mirror Wire and when the Rembrandts would play in Philadelphia next week, the Philadelphia paper would pick it up and when they would play in Providence the next week, the Providence paper would pick it up. Your story. My story and it would be special from the Baltimore Sun. Do you remember Sun. the story... When the Rembrandts played at Max's, I was at, I, I was there that night with the candles and the lights going out. So we'll tell that one in a minute. But I, I, the publicist always reached to me, and I was a trendsetter. I was an influencer because if I wrote about your band, it went up on the wire. And if the band showed up, and you had space in the paper, and you're the editor, and you're Ed Hewitt, and you're 80 years old, and you don't know the difference between Smashing Pumpkins and Rudy's band, you'll put the story in the paper because they're playing the local place. And you also right. stroke the Ron Furman of the local place and. You're being local in your local paper because this national band's coming in that wrote the friend song, and not yet, but so my so the publicist and the record companies always gave me the prime stuff. 
And part of the quid was when the new band comes, the reason I got the Rembrandts, they wanted me to write about the Rembrandts because I, they gave me ZZ Top or they gave me a big band. So they're like, hey, we gave you David Bowie, dude. Write about Smashing Pumpkins because nobody's ever heard of them. I remember the first time I saw Live in your place, too. <laughs> so Smashing Pumpkins happened because the girl at the record company called me and said, Nesta, they were always from New York, Nesta, got a new band out of Chicago. You got you to gotta go see this band, Smashing Pumpkins. And I'm like, the hell is Smashing Pumpkins? So I went down, and they were the late show that night. The night that you, the night you, they played at 11.30 at night. There was an earlier band, and I must have been Rudy, and the place kind of emptied out, and I had my heart broken that night. My girlfriend, Aaron from Penn State, broke my heart. End of my relationship, and I was, I was downhearted that night. And I didn't go to the paper having drank very many nights, but I was at the end of my run at the paper. It was 1991, and I went in there, and this publicist had told me, this band's going to be the biggest band. You got to go. There were like five people, literally. Am I, am I wrong or am I right? You remember no, you this? Were, you're right. It was I, a Thursday night. I had to go to work afterward. My boss, Mike Marlowe, who I mentioned in the last segment, he was a fisherman with, uh, with, uh, with, with Tony. Mike said, stay out late. I know, you're, I know you want to see this band. I said, Mike, this would be a big band. There were four people. I'll never forget it. They had a smoke machine. And I'm just standing there, and I'm like, and I didn't even get it. It was Gish was their first album. It was really loud. It was all distorted. I didn't get it. As a music critic, I didn't get it. And I left. And then the next, you know, and I, I'd written about them. And I moved on. I met the band, shook their hands. Because there was nobody there to shake their hands. I shook their hands. I left. And the ne I never was a Smashing Pumpkins fan. I never saw them again. And uh, I guess a decade later, a little later than a decade later, I'm at the Rolling Stones concert in Chicago at the United Center. And, and uh, I was syndicated then. And between the uh, last song and the encore, they played Jumpin' Jack Flash, they're going to play Satisfaction. I went to pee in the men's room at Chicago United, big, big bathroom. It, it was like the scene from The Shining. I walk in. One other guy walks in. He's bald. He's at the urinal. There's nobody else in the bathroom because it's the rolling. And I'm, I looked over. I looked over, and I literally said to him, I don't mean to be rude, but are you a pumpkin? <laughs> <laughs> and he looks up from the urinal, and he's like, yeah, man, yeah, man. I've said, and, and this is when I went into I'm like, dude, I saw you at Max's on Broadway in Baltimore one night, like a Thursday night. My girlfriend broke my heart. And he's like, dude, there were like five people there that night. I'm like, yeah, I was one of them. <laughs> so that's all I got for you. I got a smashing pumpkin story for you. That's it. Was it a good review that you wrote, or you know, you? Know. I didn't review it. I had previewed it. I had interviewed them so people would come and see them. Clearly, nobody bought the Evening Sun. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but but that you know, I have such memories. The Rembrandt story. I want you to tell that because my story is well, they, they were a huge band. I had written about them. That song, uh, just the way it is, baby, was a huge song. They hadn't done the friends. I, thing I don't yet. think we sold it out, but it was a pretty you know, it, it was it was it was hardy. Oh, oh, yes. And um, the power in Fell's Point all went out. Of all, all of Fell's Point. And this BG is when you know you married a smart man. You know, well, BG&E said. Ingenuity. It's, you know, it's not going to happen. We're not going to get the lights on tonight. So uh, I looked at the band, and I'm like, the show must go on. What do you guys want to do? And the brothers had a little chit-chat, and they said, we're going to do it acoustic. So and you told me this behind the bar. Was Jill DeVille tending bar? Who, who was tending bar? I think she place? might have been there then. Jill was at the bar that but night because I, I had her on. I sent my guys. Jill remembers this. I sent my guys out to find candles. I think we went over to the I hotel. remember you telling me this. You were like, we we're going to get candles. We're going to do the show. We, we brought in a whole case of candles, lit them all over the place. This can, was, can, can I tell you that I was there when you, all this was going on? Like when you're at, The crowd was giddy. Were you there that night? I don't no. know. No, there. I, it was during the week. I wasn't there. Uh, the crowd got giddy because I think you got up and said, hey, everybody, shh, shh. The band's going to play, but this is the catch. This is the real catch. You have to be quiet. It's acoustic. You have to and be it's not quiet. Because so if you're talking, we're not going to have a show. So this was the hardest thing in the world. I wish we had video camera of that, dude. 
It was, uh, it was pretty amazing. It was an incredible show. Absolutely. I'll never incredible. forget it. And that had happened a bunch of times. Coco Taylor. That happened? Okay, it happened more. Co- Coco Taylor was, it was, she was doing, I guess, the last song of the night. She's singing, you can take my husband, but don't mess with my man. And all of a sudden, boom, the power goes out. The place is packed to the gills. The temperature went up to like 180. You know, I mean, that many people. And all of a sudden, it's right like, here. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> it's hot as hell. And she's standing up there like, and I, I walked up. And I, she said, I don't know what to do. And the crowd is singing the lyrics over and over and over again. You can take my husband. Don't mess with my man. And I said, Coco, just stand there like the queen you are. And she just stood there. And they kept singing it over and over. And eventually we turned the lights up. And then she turns right to me and she goes, okay, let's go. <laughs> she was old school. Let's settle. go, man. Let's go settle the show. So I had to pay her. <laughs> she would walk off stage. We walked across the street. To well, bo- I'm sure she had been places where she hadn't been paid. She had been. They paid. all had, right? Yes. In, in your era, the people came through there who had been stiffed. Well, Springsteen she, she, writes about it in his book, and when they stiff you in the Jersey Shore, you just go home. Y- you you yes, know what I mean? Like, yeah, literally, Springsteen Shore. wrote about it in his well, book in the 70s. He's like, I played places, and when they didn't pay you, you just, you just left. You just left. Because jer- they were mafia. I mean, it's where so, it's at. So... We walk across the street. Bot Pizza had lights. They had electricity. So we walked in, and I wanted to use Larry's, uh, uh, Larry's office so I could settle hey, up with yeah. her. She walked in, and the whole place stood up because everybody came from my place to, there, to go there afterwards. So you're trying to pay they her. They all and stood up bands. and started cheering. <laughs> all, everybody's clapping, and, you know, and she just walked like a queen right, to, right into the back. We went in the office, paid the lady. Done. You know, the best part about this, you guys didn't go broke. You're still here 30 years later. Most people in the music business like went out, went under. You move things, though. But you have these We're stories. We're constantly evolving. You, you know? have stories that have colored my life. I mean, seriously. Thank like the you. Rembrandt's night, the, the night hanging out with Danny Bonaducci and David Cassidy. That, that, that was a long one. Oh, my God. <laughs> two Everyone's sh- screaming. Two shows on a Monday night sold out. I, I remember. Anyway, I think he was one of the – and I, I'm, I'm – being really honest, and of all the concerts I've seen, it was one of the greatest concerts. I he was very, very, very talented, David Cassidy. And the the band he was with was fantastic. They were great people. It was and great. David himself was a gentleman, just incredible person. You know, here he is. He's coming back. It was the comeback tour. Yeah. And it was we were one of the first places he played. You know, before he went back out on the road. Do you remember Lou Cedroni? The, the music or the uh, movie critic from the Evening Sun, yes, Lou Cedroni. He had like an Oscar that looked like him, and they, they did uh, the Lou's every year, the Cedroni Awards. Lou was, I mean, Lou was like a marathon runner in his eighties. He was a wonderful, wonderful soul. He had a special relationship with Shirley Jones, and he had known David Cassidy from the time David Cassidy was. A boy and, and knew Sean, knew the family, all of that. Um, and when when David played, Lou and Lou loved me. Lou said, "Master, I I'll, I, I know David. I'll, I, I and when David got on the phone with me and and I have the interview. I played it when he died. I have the interview. I'd love to hear it. Oh, it's on it's on my website. It's at BaltimorePositive.com. I, I promise you. Um, he was one of the nicest people. When I interviewed him, and then I came down that night, and Danny, he was doing Danny. Danny was, like, drying out, right? Danny was a mess. <laughs> Danny, I think Danny had just gotten out of Rio. Yeah, Dan, Danny was a mess. <laughs> Danny was right. drying out, as I'm saying. And Danny was dry, wasn't drinking that night. I remember, that, like, Danny was, like, really on the rough side. And I remember David even saying, I'm trying to bring my brother up and trying to help him out. Get, get him a stay. He wants to work in comedy. And Danny wound up having a great career doing radio in Philadelphia and that, that Howard Stern thing or whatever. He had a whole second life. But, but he, that night, David Cassidy was being magnanimous to him. And David Cassidy, that night, was as good as any artist I've ever seen in any place. He, he, he was really talented. So guess what the first thing he said to me when he got to Max's and Go you know, he came upstairs? He has to use the phone to call his wife. Okay. That was the first thing he did, you know, checking in, you know. And I could hear him in the other room. I wasn't trying to eavesdrop, but 
it, it was just it was he was he was a guy, a real. I, I think if I'm not mistaken, when I saw him, he invited me up. Come on upstairs, we can hang out. You know, he was like one of those kind of. And you had those little dorm rooms up on the second floor up so, there, so and it's seen everything, right? After the first show's over, I'm out back. I'm standing by the uh, back door. Woman walks up to me and says, "Could you do me a favor? Could you get David to come to the top of the, sto- the stairs?" And just wave and say my name. I said, ma'am, I can't do that. She goes, please, I'm 55 years old with a heart condition. What do you think I'm going to, you know, I, I'm, I'm harmless. I said, ma'am, the What's second. What's your name? You, I said, the second you see him, <laughs> you are going to bound up those steps. And no. <laughs> this is a guy who, I don't know if you know this, when, when he, he did the uh, stadium tours. They had riots. No, women were they ripping, over, ripping his they, clothes they off. They turned over limos looking for They him. did a uh, Partridge Family episode about that, about him being so popular that they were ripping his clothes, but that was his real life. He lived a, we still have a, he bag lived a really somewhere. strange life in that way. He was, we have a bag in the archives of the things we picked up off the floor. Panties? Yeah, things like that. Things like that. And, Personal l- and love, love <laughs> notes and teddy bears and... I mean, it was it, it's a whole different, yeah. So my era of uh, being a music critic, in 1989, the new kids on the block played the arena, and they were the biggest thing, so, and I panned them. I have the pictures and the letters. They picketed. A bunch of girls came. <laughs> this is pre, <laughs> pre-Instagram. They came down to bully me. If, I swear I'm in the building. This was before Internet. This is yeah. 1989. <laughs> so, Could you imagine if that happened now? Ron, if I did show and tell, we, next time I do this, I'm going to come back to Fell's Point. I'm going to do another show sometime soon. When I do, I, we'll, I'll bring you back. We'll do show and tell. I have this. Ter- they did a whole page of the letters of pissed off girls. And, the, and they're all, you know, Cindy Smith from Clarksville. And I'm thinking all of these girls are 35 years, 33 years older now. And so a couple of the names I actually recognized and, like, whatnot of people that wrote. But there were pictures of girls picketing in, on, on, on Calvert Street. <laughs> because and, and it you says, new- fans of the new kids criticize the critic. That was the headline. And it was a whole broad sheet of nothing but pissed off fan letters. about. So th- when you talk about passion for teen idols. Well, you you got to <laughs> think about that. That was real passion because nowadays all they have to do is be a keyboard warrior and just type up a sure. letter. They had to get in their car. Well, Mom probably drove them, but brought them down to pick it. I love seeing the old pictures of the Beatles, the girls all <sighs> aghast when the plane's landing and all that. K-pop still has that. <laughs> we don't have that anywhere else. Ron Furman is here, the Furman family. Joy. For, for you guys in doing this with beer and being, what you said the front end, you said that the TV beer, TV beer is what I did. I, I promoted Coors and Miller and Bud. They, they kept WNST Nothing live. Nothing wrong with fed it. Fed families for a long time. And I remember you were the front guy doing fancy beer, Gucci beer, European beers. Back, back then they were microbrews. Before that. Now they're craft beers. The craft well, there was a pl- so I'm Venezuelan, and when I would go to Venezuela in the 80s, I would drink a beer called Polar. It's un tipo de cerveza. Um, and, and H.O. Venezuela. So you get in Miami. And in Fort Lauderdale, but you could never get it up here. There was a bar in D.C. Brick Skeller. Brick, I was going to say Rath Skeller. Brick Skeller. The Brick Skeller. And this is 92, 93, 94. My friend David Hiller had the outside pitch, the old Oriole magazine. He lived down in D.C. And he told me, they have your beer down here. So 1992, you get in the car and you drive down to D.C. And I, I had two Polars or whatever. And I felt like I was special because I had my Venezuelan beer. And anytime I've been in... Miami in the 90s, I would bring a six-pack home, you know, whatever. But I've never, I've never had a Polar here that I bought here. I don't even – and then Venezuela has embargoes and all sorts of stuff. When you started doing the beer thing, I was still drinking, you know, blonde light beers. Uh, I had a Guinness earlier. I don't think I had ever had a black and tan in my life until I was 35, turn of the century, probably sometime in 2000 like that. When did you make that – you made it in 95 to a tap house, but when did you see that happening? Because I'm thinking, you know Matt Crow. Of course, everybody knows Matt Crow, right? Yeah, well, I – Matt had sold those beers, and I, I was married, so I was living downtown. I guess 06, 07, 08 is right around the time I had my first peanut butter porter or my first 
anything like that. I was a 40-year-old man at that time. So tastes were made. You jumped across and said you're going to be the Brick Skeller of Baltimore. You were Well, when we did music, I still had those coolers behind the bars. And, they, and we probably What did you had, have? Like, what, what, what we, Becks? We, those were the cut, low and brow. And there was also, there was an importer called Merchant Devin that was bringing over, like... Uh, but what were the beers that sold? I, I guess Smittix or Foster's, right? Sure. Like, you had Foster's, yeah. yeah that Foster's was a big beer then. It, it Heineken just, was just kind of catching on then, kind of, sort of? It was still, it was pretty popular at that point, you know. It was the People most popular loved the beer of that kind. They thought Grosch. it was really Cause fancy. Because of, of the top, you know. I was going to say you had Grosch. Yeah, I mean, Carlsberg, I, I, you know. Carlsberg. I didn't like any of them. You know what I mean? Like, and, and so you had them, and I never noticed it because I wasn't like, oh, I'm going to try a new beer tonight because Ron turned me on to this dark motor oil is what we call it, right? It looked like motor oil when you dumped it out, right? <laughs> We're laughing now, but you wouldn't be laughing if it was 1992 because I'd say to you, dude, I care about you and your family. What are you doing selling this, man? Like, how, how are, how's anybody ever going to come in and pick between 1,000 beers? You saw it, though. I, you you know, I, I, I would tell people, you never have to drink the same beer twice. You know, life is an adventure. Do something, you know. How many different beers do you have now? A thousand? Oh, over we a thousand. have mm-hmm. over 1,500 different bottled beers and 107 rotating taps that always change. So you said something to me really interesting in the beginning. You're like, there was this one importer. <laughs> That we did the Kolsch and we did the stuff that people wanted with the funny tops. At what point did that really jump? I mean, I'm thinking locally like Duclaw. I'm thinking locally about the first local. But it probably changed when um, um, the bar down on Cross Street. What's his name? Clipper City. Uh, 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 Hugh. Hugh. Sissons. Hugh Sisson. Sisson. Hugh was the f- – before uh, you. He was uh, the first guy I met that was really into beer. Here's a funny story, though. I was friends with Joe Young. Um, Gold. Joe Gold, and Joe had worked for Young's. I ran Young's into Joe Brewery. a couple weeks ago. Joe's a okay. great guy. So Joe and I, the building on the corner on Boston Street. Um, Hudson Street? No. What, I forgot what it's called Hudson now. Street Stackhouse? No. No. Right right next to the uh, to the little shopping center there. Um, the Safeway? Yeah. No. Okay. Keep go- but it was a sushi place. I don't know what it is now. It Red, is a sushi place It's a now. sushi place now. Oh, Weber's on Finn. Boston. No. Yes. Whatever. Was it Weber's on Boston? Didn't Bo Hager have that one it's time? It's Katana's now. That was Weber's on Boston. Okay. Merritt Dworkin is here. Merritt, that was uh, Weber's on Boston, right? Katani? Yeah, there. See, Merritt knows. See, she's, she's in the... Yeah. So Joe and I went to go look at that building, and we were going to open up the first brew pub in Baltimore, in Maryland. And, and that and became Redfish right. after that. We did okay. not... We put in an offer on the building. Somebody else got it, so we didn't get the building. It was probably a good thing, because... Joe Didn't have a lot of parking. <laughs> well, Joe and I would have probably killed each other. But anyway, um, <laughs> I love Joe. But, but anyway. But we, your vision was a, a brew, a craft beer bar before people knew what craft was. Micro was the word, right? Alonzo's had 60 beers. They had a list. You went in and, and they burgers. had a list. And burgers. <laughs> and burgers. Big burgers. burgers. And, and I was like, they got 60, I'll have 600, you know. So I think at the time with music, we probably had like 300 different bottled beers. We didn't and have about that. That was, you know, when you said you had 300 beers. People came in and they'd look at it and that's a neat label. They'd right. never had it before. They tried it, you know. My father loved beer. I loved beer. We had a big beer can collection at beer home. Beer can collection. It's Billy yeah. Beer, remember that? Back in the 70s? Yeah, there you go. What didn't taste it's good. horrible. <laughs> I think I, still, I think I still have a six-pack somewhere. Well, I, I, I would say for beer and what it's become industry, and for our state, for Guinness and what has happened there, and I think the brew pubs, I, I drove to the Eastern Shore, drive down 50, there's breweries in places. Out in Hartford County, north of Baltimore County, breweries in places. It, it was something I don't think I saw. And I guess I accepted the monopoly of TV beer and thinking – well, they're, it's kind of like weed, right? They're, they're never, it's never going to happen. It's never going to be legal. And the microbrew thing, people had a vision for being um, bootleggers or whatever it would be. I mean, that's what it was called 30 years ago, right? But the fact that you could make beer and have a license to make beer and then make different kinds of beer that people would actually drink. You got 100 taps? Is that what you have? 107. How do you, what's the secret of keeping a beer tap clean? <laughs> <laughs> I knew that would be a question. 
we do it every week. You know, it's it, when, when we change from one style to another, the line gets clean. You know, when uh, Jason rotates it, what, every two weeks, he's mm -hmm. rotating them all and cleaning them out. And Tell me about the menu. And it's not, I, and it's not cheap. I know you were, you're proud of your menu. You, I'm real proud of the menu. I'm my, proud my, of your menu, too. My, I had my, delicious uh, barbecue last year. I had some, some beans. I got to stop and get some food to go. Dur during COVID, uh, we were trying to figure out how we were going to, you know, how we were going to get back into business. Our menu was too big. It was too, you know, and we lost our whole kitchen staff. So uh, originally I went up to Outlaw Barbecue, Steve in Hampstead. Go up there sometime. Great product. Um, People have bright. I haven't been to his place. It's, it's great. It's the barbecue tour is next year. I'm doing the crab cake tour right now. We'll start at Steve's. I'll take okay, you over there. Fair enough. And, I don't uh, have to be on a tour to eat barbecue, dude. I'm, <laughs> I don't even talked into that. You don't have to twist my arm. Well, I went to Steve, and I, I'd known him from going in there and getting food, and, and he knew who I was and what I did. And um, I said, Steve, I got to reopen. Help me out. I want to do a pit beef. I can figure out how to do it myself, but it'd be easier if you showed me how. He basically took his arms, put them around me, and said, let's go. And he showed me everything that I needed to do, portions, pro everything. You know, I mean, it was really touching. That, And I get tears in my eyes sometimes when I talk about but it. But it's, it's a hard thing when you're going to make a move like that. I mean, look, I made a move to Baltimore Positive from being the Nasty Nestor sports guy. When you start to, to move things, it, Anytime. It, it's scary. Imagine when I went from music – to what I am today. Right. I was scared to death. I called up J.D. Considine, and I said, hey, J.D., music, last show's going to be January 1st, 1994, and I'm done. And he said, what are you going to do? I said, I don't even know. <laughs> and that's I got a truth. bar. I, I said, I'll figure something out, yeah. but I'm not doing what I've been doing. I'm not making, you know, I need to make money. So I had a family. I had to start bringing in some income. Anyway, um, back to what Gail's was not, the present. Yeah. She's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> make some money. Now she'd like me to come back to work more. But uh, <laughs> 107 taps. Somebody's got to look after them. You know. Anyway, where was I? Bring me you, back you, there. You, oh, you I went to barbecue. Steve. We make a barbecue. So Steve helped me get started. And then my son-in-law, who is a psychologist who works at Hopkins, who is also uh, an incredible cook, he came in and helped me put the whole menu together. And it's what it is today. We smoke all our own meats. Smoked portobello sandwiches, everything, and it's great. I and delivered 80 sandwiches this morning around the corner to someone. Well, so if you they're got well it, fed today. They so the people, as you're, as, as you're coming back to work, if your office needs food, we can feed you. You know, come down, try it out. You know. And he's got a thousand beers. Just don't drink them all at once. Uh, you know. If you do, we'll pay for the cab ride home. Well, I appreciate you guys coming by and uh, and telling some stories. I, you're like, what are we going to talk about? I'm like, beer, music, barbecue. Who would I, listen to that? I'm such an introvert. I don't. You know, I, it's like you gotta get can't him out. A word in. You gotta get him out a little bit. Where's your daughter? Where's Brina? What's going on here? She's uh, our daughter's in the events business. So during COVID, she came in. She helped us get back open. She's still. Give Last it, time I had a growler over there, it was because of her. She's, so. she's still putting time in over there, but she had an event in my, where is she, Miami. in Miami. She's in Miami. And, uh, you know, she's, she's a big I wish shot. I were in Miami. I canceled my trip to Miami last week. My back's been Just killing Just because you me. were here, right? Nah, my back's a mess. Sitting, sitting here is killing me. I'm sitting on a, on a pad. I, I had needles in my spine 16 days ago, I, man. I've had those before, too. They suck. Getting old is really tough. <sighs> man. But remember, remember those days of Rembrandts and candlelight Rembrandts and Grolsch beer with tops that come off. You know, off that happened. Uh, we lost power with um, Amy Mann one time. Oh, God, I love Amy Mann. I love Amy. I still love Amy Mann. I have such a crush on Amy Mann. I interviewed her in the Till Tuesday era at Hammerjacks, and she autographed some stuff for me. And I still have it. And she wrote, to Nestor, fond remembrances. Love Amy. <laughs> I have a she was supposed to be our last show. No, the what was your no, last no, show? No, no. The last show was Why Not. Oh, yeah. okay. All right. That was, that was the last show. But now, P Peter Himmelman? You, she, you she played the last month. Uh, Don Dixon played. Uh, what's his name? Don uh, Dixon produced the greatest rock and roll album ever, Life's uh, Rich Pageant from R.E.M. Don and Marty, when I did my 20th anniversary, I did it. We, we did a show out on the square. Don and Marty played your place all the time, right? Right, but they came up and, you know, I hadn't have done music. I don't remember. 
10 years. And Don and Marty came up and did the show. You still do music once a year at Fells Point Festivals down here. Uh, that's not me. I, I know. You sent Kimber on that. That's fine. Let her, let her deal with the bands. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm tired. You go watch the Jim Blossoms. You I'll need tell to pay you, them. I went. Everybody, look, you know, check your calendars. Lancaster Blues and Roots and Blues Fest. Gail and I just went. It was fantastic. Lancaster, Pennsylvania? Yes. Uh -huh. My friend Rich Ruhoff produces the whole what, thing. What weekend is it? Well, I think it's going to be in July, in July next, next, year. next year. This It was just a few weeks ago. Uh, Joan Osborne played, uh, Charlie Musselwhite, uh, Sweet Lita, and Ron Holloway. Uh, I walked up to Ron after the show, and I said, Hey, Ron, when was the last time you played Maxis? And he went, Buddy Guy. I, oh. said, I said, Ron, you know who this is? And he, Ron, it's Ron Furman. <laughs> The owner and he was like oh my god and we just sat down and started talking i had time. pizza bop after your show <laughs> <laughs> gail and ron are here we're down and up we're broadway um i had my way i gotta give a plug to I, I i wasn't finished my story on what barbecue no on lancaster oh, i'm gonna give a plug to rich well, ruhoff what you want, man that's what i'm here for do, do we got enough time no maybe i have enough to, all you're I have gonna make time. the time for me for you yeah so gail and i went to go see a show the last day um, at, at the Blues Festival. It was 12.30 in the morning, you know, or not the morning, but the early afternoon. You know, the first act. Is this outdoor, the Lancaster thing? No, it was indoor. Okay. Everything was uh, indoor. Okay, all right. So uh, this is on the main stage in the Civic Center. We walk in. This kid was, she, she wrote her first music at 16, put a video out, if I got the story right, put a video out at 17, got over a million hits, Put another video out. Got another million hits. Before she turned 18, she had a re major record deal. Never left the house. You know, she lives in... This is during COVID. Right. So, family lives in Tampa. The, the record company said, you got to move to L.A. She's working with some really big people. This kid just turned 18. Name? Her name's Vela. Vela. V-E-L-L-A? A voice like you would not believe. Rocked my oh world. Oh, my God. He's still a music guy at heart. You know, you still want to open the place I, back I, you up know what? down here. I, I'm sitting there, and I'm going, man, maybe we could do this again. You know, and I, I and think my wife look, is like, don't even, get, don't she, even get the idea. She's a star. And we put the Greenberry Woods back together, I know. <laughs> Is that good? You like that? That's a pretty good reference, right? Good guys. I don't even need the internet, the Woodies. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you, man. I appreciate the barbecue, the years. Uh, part of the tapestry of my life you are, Ron Furman. Well, thank you very much. Part of my thanks almost, for having me here. I, I love that the almost famous people of my life that are still around. I had Jimmy Babjack on from the Smithereens. One of the greatest thrills of my life. I was at Bo Hager's, 92, I'm on the radio, 92, 93. Just on the radio, but we were eating crabs when they had the crab deck there. And uh, Steve from uh, Mix 106 was running. Steve Cochran was running the place for Damien. And there was a band playing college then on Thursday. And the drummer came back and knew the band and said, will you guys get up and play? And it was just Mike and Jimmy, the drummer and Pat, the singer, weren't there. And they're like, yeah, what do you know? Stone, who? What do you want to play? And he's like, I want to play Smithereen song. And like, well, we know that, but like, the guys in the band know the song. He's like, nah, I'm just a drummer in a band. I love you guys. I want to play, but like, I, you know, I want to play some of the re-song. I don't. We don't really know any Stones. This is the early '90s. They're all, you know, playing all that Nirvana and like whatever college rock, and uh, they didn't know any Stones or who. And I said, you guys play, I'll sing. They're like, all right, let's do it. So we get up, and they've been drinking, eating crabs, the whole thing. Place was packed on a college night, and I got up and did three Smithereen songs with the Smithereens. So, th to me, I'm smiling ear to ear 30 years later. It's still one of the great thrills of my life. But it all, like, those music stories from those years, they're all coming back in these. You're all alive to tell them about the <laughs> night the lights went out and where you got the candles from. Sue Costa wasn't down there with candles back then, right? No, no. Oh, I was thinking about another. Whoops. Go ahead. Sorry. You're fine. No, you're, you're okay. fine. I'm fine. I'm f no, it's I'm, AM radio. I, no one's listening. It's fine. I, I'm not fine. But anyway, um, after we, we changed over and started doing what we do today, I get a phone call at home, and it's uh, David, uh, I can't remember his last name now, from uh, Soul Silent. Oh, okay. Perner. Dave Perner. He right. played your place. He called me up at I'm home. Doing a, I'm doing an acoustic tour. Can I come by and play? No. no? <laughs> he said, I'm here with 
Winona and we're doing a wrap-up party for this movie they, they just shot. Can we do a party and can you rent us the back line and we'll do a show at Max's. Set up by the fireplace. This was right after I had renovated. And he played, though. And he played. Oh, okay. Yeah, All right. We got pictures of it. Now, he's you know? from Minnesota. My, the guy I'm going out to dinner with tomorrow night from Minnesota is really close with him because of the Minnesota connection. And uh, I almost saw that. I was in New York right before the plague, and he played, like, the city winery. And I wanted to go see him. Perner, Runaway Train, right? Oh, yeah. Never Coming Back. That's a great, great album. album. But great album. I interviewed Himmelman back in the day because of, the, like, the, uh, the – He the, drove me crazy. I love Peter. But, but he had, like, the, the Dylan connection, right? Right. And, Father-in-law. And Mar- Father-in-law. Yeah. And, and uh, the Wallflowers are playing down at Soundstage uh, this weekend. I th- or next weekend, I think. There's all of this Dylan stuff that kind of comes through you, too, to me. He, he comes to my place. I, knew, I didn't know much about him. Um, the show starts, and he said uh, he started giving me a hard time about the TVs around the room. He says, where's that Furman guy, the owner, in front of 300 people? I mean, we were packed. He said, you got to turn these TVs off. I'm going to do a song that's really, you know, from the heart. And, I don't, you know, i got, like, sports time on here. Come on. Turn. So I go around. I turn off all the TVs. He plays the song, and he goes, all right, so the next song, and he sets up the whole next song. He says, but you know what? Furman, go turn all the TVs back on. Now he's got me running around to all the TVs, turning them I back I might on. have been there that night. You probably were. Then literally. he said, we're making so much money out on the road. We're giving away grants. So I'm going to pass out paper. Furman. <laughs> and he's, you know, he's got a road manager. He What's was he? an activist, was it? Really, he was starts, an activist. I, I am sitting there passing out paper and crayons. And he said, while I'm playing a song, I want you to draw pictures and whatever. And I remember I was at this show. Okay. I and was when at we're that done, show. then he that. has he's Furman, he calls me. He Bring has me up. tape all the pictures up on the wall behind the stage. Then he brings the entire audience to walk by like it's in a museum. And we're going to just – and he started picking out pictures. He had really good drugs. I mean, obviously. No, no. no. He just, just the way he is. He was just great. Then he took everybody outside. The entire 300 people, he takes them outside, plays on the square. The police come. <laughs> it, was, it was crazy. One time. No wonder you quit the rock and roll life. I did. These are the stories I, I didn't did, know. Wait a minute. I'm I like, did, why did Ron give up other than the money? This I did the first rock and roll show at the Walters Art Gallery. They have a theater that held like held three. Thousand? I might no, know this. Like I might people. know this. You might ask Peter me played a- there. I know But this. he had to end at 10 o'clock. Had to because. Rules. Well, you you got, it's a museum. You know, yeah. it's like there's precious objects there. So they got to close the museum down. 10 o'clock, he won't stop playing. So Tom walks over and unplugs the guitar, his road manager. He walks over to the piano, starts playing the piano. <laughs> he walks over and he pushes the piano. Walks over to the drum set. So, so the band's picking up all the gear. And then Peter gets up and goes. Everybody, go down to Max's. We're finishing the night right. So, yeah, half the audience comes to Max's. It was a Tuesday night, three bands for three bucks. They all walk in. I asked the band, hey, can they borrow your instruments for a little while? The band was enamored. They loved it. They got up and played. Played the rest of the night. You should write a book, Furman. Good seeing you, Gail. Good seeing you. Good seeing you, Ronnie. Take care. Next time, Breed is coming on now, all right? We'll talk about event planning. (laughs) <laughs> I'm sorry we didn't get a crab cake, but I did get a beer and you got a ginger ale. And I got great stories. This is how you got me here. I love you, man. You said, hey, come over and have a crab cake. It's crab cake tour. You want a crab cake? I'll get you I, I'm going to get you. I'm going to get a Merit's crab cake. Merit's here. And, I'm gonna, and I, I'm gonna Eddie, did Eddie Lauer stiff me? Is that possible? Would a musician stiff me? Never. I, I mean, is that even possible? Where's Ed Lauer? I got to text him. He was supposed to be here. I thought he was going to come sing to me. Hold I on. thought we were going to talk about Baltimore City. I'm so glad you didn't. What do you want to know? We're trying to fix it. I hope so. We are. I mean, we, gotta we are. Fix it. We got to fix it. Well, that's what this is about. This is about good people in good places, and we want to make the city better. We do. It's not going to be easy. Never easy. In my lifetime, you promise? I can't promise. I promise I'm going to try. I don't know how long you're going to live. I better hurry. <laughs> Ron Furman is here. Uh, Gail is here. Breen is not here, but Max's is here. It's right across the street. Stop by, get some barbecue, get a beer, get a growler. We're down here at the Chop Tank. I, I have my Chop Tank glass. I was holding that up. It's all presented by the Maryland Lottery. Let yourself play. We're going to be 
<sighs> Let's see. We did Silver Spring Mining Company in Perry Hall or White Marsh. Depends on who you ask. I learned that yesterday. Uh, we're in Fells Point today. On Wednesday, we're at Lexington Market. We're going to be at Fadley's eating some crab cakes down there. Uh, some good guests. Brian Frosch, our attorney general, will be there, uh, as well as Ben Jealous going to join us on Wednesday. Friday, we're at Nick's Grandstand Grill and Timonium. A lot of friends, Jim Reese, some others coming out to join us. And then Mayor Brandon Scott on Wednesday the 17th at Coco's Pub. Having a Coco's Crab Cake uh, since the 90s. i got to have the last word. Go ahead. Say goodbye. Hey, goodbye, everybody. But I want to tell you something. Baltimore still is a great city. It's got its problems, but it's a great place. Come on down. We, we definitely, Fells Point, I know we've had our... Well, this is the reason I did the show shows on Friday afternoons between like 2 and 5. I figured it'd be soft and quiet, and when it ends, I'm here and going to have a beer, and it's happy hour. My wife just asked me how I'm doing. I said, come on over and have is a beer. Is she coming over? Yeah, I think she's going to come over and have a beer. She, she'll probably want to have pit beef instead. Well, she's had a lot does of crab drink, cakes. Does she drink real beer? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm going to text her right now and say, Ron Tell Furman says you should come down. Uh, Ron Furman says you should come and drink beer. Okay. There you go. There you I'm go. I'm going to be waiting for her downstairs. She drinks the expensive stuff. Gail's buying. She's worth it. <laughs> <laughs> I am Nestor. We are WNST AM 1570. Big thanks to the Maryland Lottie for sponsoring this. Let yourself play. We're playing. It's the Maryland Crab Cake Tour from Fells Point. Back for more. Merritt's going to join us, and I'm looking for Ed Lauer. <laughs>